Tonight we are delighted to have as our speaker, Persa Strell, director of the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. She will be speaking to us tonight on the conception, construction, and startup of the Linux Coherent Light Source and its first environmental results. This light source is the world's brightest source of hard X-ray laser light, a billion times brighter than any previous source of X-rays in of X-ray laser light. Dr. Drell will give us a hint of the new frontiers that this new technology will make accessible to us, and in the process, we will hear about the evolution of her national laboratory and what it is doing and the reinvention of that national laboratory using this new tool. In addition to her role as the director of the laboratory, she is a professor of particle physics and astrophysics at Stanford University. She received her BA in physics and mathematics from Wellesley College and her PhD in atomic physics from the University of California at Berkeley. She was a professor of physics at Cornell University from 1988 to 2002, and then she joined the National Laboratory as professor and director of research. She became its director in 2007. She is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Persa Stratton. Very honored uh, to be here tonight. And I'm going to be telling you a story. And on its surface, it's a story about how we have built a revolutionary new instrument. And that revolutionary new instrument, that tool, the world's first X ray free electron laser, and by the end of this lecture, I hope you're going to know what those words mean if you don't already, how that tool has opened a new scientific frontier. It turned on in 2009, and it is allowing us to study the world, not just what it looks like, but actually dynamics at the atomic scale. That's opening new fields within biology, material science, physics, chemistry. I'll give you some examples of some of the new science that's coming out of it. And it really is, I think, a classic example of a new tool opening a new frontier, letting us see the world as we've never been able to see it before. And that's really very exciting. That new frontier is wide open. However, as with all good stories, there's several subplots. There's a subplot about the evolution of the field of particle physics. There's a subplot about the evolution and rebirth of a national laboratory. Slack National Accelerator Laboratory, in fact. We even had to change our name. So we used to be Slack, excuse me, we used to be Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. That's what Slack stood for. We are now Slack National Accelerator Laboratory. The reason that was done could interest only the lawyers in the audience. And I won't go into the details unless somebody really wants to hear the story. And then there's a subplot of a technical achievement that many thought was just impossible. Now, all these plots and subplots are interwoven. You might think Dickens here, where you actually don't really see why they're related until some serendipitous event happens, and then you see that, in fact, they all were meant to be related to each other all the time, I think it's going to make it rather challenging for Justin to describe this lecture <laughs> at the next meeting. I'm almost tempted to come back and, and hear it, how he's going to do this. Um, but you will see, I hope, the deep interconnects between the different storylines. And as with Dickens, um, most of the time, uh, the ending is a pretty happy ending for most of the players. And they've all been changed by their interrelation with each other. And luck plays a really important role. So let's start with ah, my little clicker is in my briefcase. I'm starting with the overview, which you can see on the screen. Here we go. So just make it easier for me to move around. 
There we go, and also give me a nice. So this is an aerial view of the laboratory. So it's a two mile long, dead straight electron accelerator. We'll talk a little about what that means. You can, it's a feature on, on Google Earth if you want to look for it. If you're flying into the Bay Area, it's not, in plane is at the right uh, position coming up the bay. You can see it. This is where most of the experimental uh, work is done. This is Sand Hill Road, the address for venture capital within the Bay Area. They're, the VCs are right across the street from us. For those of you who spend any time in the Bay Area, you've driven on Freeway 280. It's one of the two arteries up and down the peninsula and by far the prettier drive. It runs right over our accelerator. We are one of 10 science labs, national laboratories funded by the Office of Science by the Department of Energy in the model of government-owned contractor-operated facilities. Stanford University manages the contract for the federal government to run SLAC. Uh, we're all Stanford employees. And whereas the government owns the facilities, Stanford owns the land. They lease 420 acres to the federal government at, I would like to point out, no fee for the benefit of having this world-class facility uh, right next to their campus. The main Stanford campus, Hoover Tower, is about two miles down the road here. And there's a question about the San Andreas Fault. I'll show you in a different picture, but it's about two miles from the end of the Linac over on that side. So, in the beginning, this is what Slack looked like in the early sketches before it was built. And you can see the two mile long electron accelerator. The idea of that is you're going to take electrons, which are like really easy to, to uh, get a bunch of electrons together. They're everywhere. They come out of your wall plug. But then you were going to take those electrons and make them very, very energetic at the end of this linear accelerator. And you were going to slam those electrons into targets. And I'll tell you about the science goal in a minute. I just want to go over the sites of interesting uh, features. Freeway 280 was on the drawing board, but not built yet. However, the bridge going over the accelerator was built at the same time that the LINAC was built, starting in 1962. The reason for that was they wanted to sink the pilings to the freeway bridge at the same time they built the accelerator housing so that later on they wouldn't disturb the alignment because if you're going to shoot a bunch of electrons two miles, it's got to be straight. And what you see on the surface, for those of you who haven't seen Slack, you're actually seeing what's called the Kleistron Gallery. It's where our power sources are housed. But the actual accelerator, where the electrons are accelerating up, is 40 feet below ground. So the target buildings are here. And what Slack was born to do, what it was designed to do in uh, 1962, was to answer questions about what are the fundamental building blocks of all the matter that we see around us in the universe. What is, what are the forces that hold those building blocks together and how do they interact? So just to remind you, uh, by, the, by the beginning of the 20th century, we knew that the atom was not a fundamental object. It had structure. It had a nucleus and an electron cloud around it. And then throughout the first half of the 20th century, we learned that the protons and neutrons that made up the nucleus of the atom themselves were not point-like particles, that they had structure. The electron did not appear to have structure. And so the idea here was to use point-like electrons, give them a lot of energy, smash them into a proton, or a target made of lots of protons, and see if we could figure out whether the proton was uh, a bag of something like jelly, a uniform distribution of charge, or whether the proton was like jam, that it had seeds of charge inside of it. And that was a question that we didn't know the answer to in 1962. And that was the first major experimental campaign that was done at SLAC, was to take the highest energy electrons in the world, smash them into targets made of protons and neutrons, if the proton or the neutron was this nice uniform bag of jelly, the electrons would go through, they might be deflected a little, but they would go through with small deflections. If the proton and the neutron instead had seeds of charge in them, you would occasionally, the electron beam would come very close to one of those seeds and you get a large angle deflection. 
all relativistic, of course, but that's what was the experiment that was done in end station A. The answer was there were seeds inside the proton. They were the quarks. And the up and down quarks were discovered in those early experiments in Slack. It was, uh, uh, they were groundbreaking experiments. The Nobel Prize was given to the three uh, leaders of that experiment. And Slack went on in the 70s and early 80s to be part of what was just an incredible campaign in the field of particle physics to figure out what were the fundamental building blocks of nature. And so, I'm, by the way, not giving a lecture on particle physics, but it's very important to the laboratory and its history to understand that's what the laboratory was going to do, and that's how the laboratory identified itself. And the field of particle physics was spectacularly successful within that period. And within that spectacularly successful field, SLAC was the center of the universe. Because in 1974, first having discovered the quarks in the late 60s and early 70s, in 1974, they built another machine that was fed by that two-mile-long limit. And for Richter got the Nobel Prize for discovering the charm quark. And that was a big surprise. Why was that a big surprise? Because with the up and down quark, I can explain, I can explain what you're made of and everything we see around us here. Why do we need more quarks? And this was the first evidence that two quarks wasn't enough. And that was a, a major watershed year for the field of particle physics. The uh, strange quark had been discovered uh, before. Once we knew the up and down quark were there, we knew the strange quark was there. Charm meant there was another doublet. The, um, the B quark was subsequently discovered at Fermilab. There was a, another electron-like object discovered at Slack the Tau, so there were two more Nobel Prizes. The forces, the <coughs> electromagnetic force, strong and weak force, we learned a great deal about them. We actually also learned we could unify them. And we got towards the end of the 20th century with a model of particle physics that when I asked the question, what are the fundamental building blocks and the fundamental forces, the spectacular thing is I can write it on one page, on one slide. And that was a huge achievement. A huge achievement. The only problem was it was wrong. Okay. Pride goes before a fall. I know you've had talks on this, so this is not a surprise to you. But in the late 90s, particle physicists discovered that they had just spent 40 years understanding in great depth and detail about 4% of what makes up the entire universe. And 96% of the universe was made of forms of energy and matter that we still don't know what they are and we don't understand. And worse yet, the evidence for dark matter and dark energy did not come from the primary tool of the high energy physicists, the accelerator. It came from, it came from ground-based and space-based observatories. It came from space. So this was a bit of a shock. Now, it was great because instead of being a field where we were close to the answer, it was now a field that was wide open. The response at Slack, and this was a time at Slack when the frontier of particle physics was moving elsewhere. Slack was the center of the universe in particle physics in the 70s and into the 80s. But when you got into the 90s, both CERN and Fermilab, Fermilab in Illinois, CERN in uh, the Great International Lab in Geneva, had more powerful uh, accelerators. The energy frontier was no longer at Slack. There was a very beautiful machine at Slack built to study the details of the bottom quark, but it was, it was studying the details. It wasn't the frontier anymore. And so Slack's response was instead of, we, we seeded this frontier. Actually, there's a, one more point I wanted to make here before I go on to that, which is just to say that I, we still don't know what we're going to do with dark energy. But in, at least with dark matter, there is hope that the Large Hadron Collider at CERN will, will be able to tell us uh, the, what those particles are. But you've got to go to the energy frontier. And my point is that by this point, the energy frontier was no longer at Slack. Okay? So Slack did something which is previous directors, it's the vision of, of, of Richter and Jonathan Dorfman. They said, hey, all this new information about dark matter and dark energy is coming from the world of particle astrophysics. We should start to move our particle physics program towards particle astrophysics. And so uh, the uh, Faraday Gamma Ray Space Telescope, uh, the payload for that was built uh, which in a joint DOE uh, NASA project, integrated at Slack. It was launched. This is a picture of the universe in gamma rays, which is actually 
allowing us to set very powerful constraints on some of the uh, dark matter, potential dark matter models that would lead lots of dark matter uh, particles out there in the galaxy for us to discover. The next phase of the SLAC particle astrophysics program is a lar the large synoptic survey telescope, which will be a large field of view ground-based telescope, which will be our next major tool to study dark energy, joint DOE and NSF project. So SLAC started to turn its particle physics towards particle astrophysics. And a, what I think was, was a very strategic uh, move. But to give you a sense of how dramatic this change was, if you visited SLAC in 2007, well, we were building the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, but that was a tiny part of the lab actually involved with it. Most of the laboratory was operating accelerators for particle physics. The LINAC was being used to inject into this big ring to, to do these detailed studies of bottom quarks. We had a little x-ray source. The, the machine that had been used to discover the charm quark and the tau lepton had been turned into a source of intense x-rays. But that was kind of a small operation to give you uh, numbers, perhaps, to help you. This was a $30 million operation, and this was a $150 million, $170 million operation. So the laboratory, even in 2007, it was a particle physics laboratory operating accelerators for particle physics. If you then looked at SLAC two years later, in 2009, we were no longer operating any accelerators for particle physics. We had, we're still operating this little ring of intense x-rays, but we had turned on the machine I'm going to spend most of the rest of the talk talking about, the LINAC coherent light source, which used that same electron linear accelerator to make some of the most uh, spectacular, unique x-ray beams in the world. So at this point, um, we really need to answer the question, why the heck should I be interested in x-ray beams? Okay. I've been swept away, motivated by the particle physics mission of figuring out what the universe is at its most fundamental levels. How can x-rays be interesting compared to that? So to answer that question, I have to remind you of the two fundamental properties of x-rays that are going to be important. One of them you are all very, very familiar with. X-rays penetrate matter. So you go to the doctor and you get an X-ray, right? Because he wants to see if you're, you've broken your arm. Or do you have pneumonia in your lungs? X-rays penetrate. Uh, my favorite example of that is the following picture. This is my son when he was about eight years old. It's an X-ray shoulder to pelvis. Uh, his nice straight spine, no scoliosis there, and he had swallowed a quarter. Okay. So we heard him <laughs> making screaming, and the good news was he was screaming because if you're screaming, your windpipe is blocked. But we called the emergency room, and uh, they said bring him in because they wanted to make sure the quarter had gotten safely to his stomach and wasn't caught in his esophagus somewhere. They did a beautiful job with the X-ray. The, uh, the quarter is dead on to the x-ray beam, and in the original, the focus is so well good you can see George Washington. <laughs> so x-rays penetrate now. But there's another property of x-rays that's going to be very important that you don't use in your everyday life, and that is that x-rays can tell us, because of their very short wavelength, much shorter than visible light, they can tell us where atoms are in materials. And people have used x-rays to study atomic structure for decades. That is nothing new. They can also look at where electrons are in materials, which is what controls a lot of the properties of materials. So there's been a booming business in using little x-ray sources, like the, the small one at Slack, the little round one, making very intense beams of x-rays, allowing us to study structure of materials, structural bi biologically interesting materials, and learning about their properties, well-established, long-established field. What we've never been able to do, though, is 
figure out or have a way of looking at atomic structure in time, on atomic time scales. So that we've only been able to take, if you will, pictures with a very slow shutter speed. That's what changes with the X-ray laser. So again, I, I like analogies, let me give you one. Back in 1878, there was a question of whether all four legs of the galloping horse lifted off the ground when the horse was galloping. There was a bet. Senator Stanford was involved. I don't really know what the terms of the bet were. And there was this guy, Edward Murbridge, who really liked cameras. And he was making cameras with ever faster shutter speed to be able to do stop action photography and see motion with a resolution that was better than what we had with our eyes. Okay? That's pretty revolutionary back at the time. He had a new camera, a new shutter speed, a new, developed a new technique where he could have a shutter speed of 0.001 seconds. And with that fast shutter speed, he was able to take a series of stop action photographs of the galloping horse and answer the question conclusively that all four feet of the galloping horse were off the ground, and it was when the feet were under the horse's body, not when they were splayed. This comes straight off of Wikipedia, by the way, and there's also a running buffalo. If you want to go home and answer the question, do all four feet of the running buffalo leave the ground at the same time? I won't give you the answer. You have to go look it up for yourself. So fast shutter speed is also that same effect can be reproduced with a fast stroke, and I think we're all familiar with how that works. So that's the concept. Now, what if you had an x-ray camera, so you can look at structure at the atomic level, with a shutter speed of 0 0.000000000000001 seconds, which is 10 femtoseconds. If you had that shutter speed, well, the atomic time scale is femtoseconds. The time for the, if you want to think classically or semi-classically, for the electron to go around the proton in the hydrogen atom, the Bohr orbit time, is a femtosecond. Femtosecond is the time scale of chemistry. What if you had an X-ray camera with femtosecond shutter speed? Well, you could see atoms and electrons moving on their natural, natural time scale. We've never been able to do that before. You could watch a chemical reaction, atom by atom. Why would you want to do that? Well, take one of the most common chemical reactions, photosynthesis. We know the in beginning products, we know the end products. It turns out it's a multi-step <laughs> chemical process with very complex electron exchange. We have some pretty good models, but in point of fact, we don't know how the details of how <coughs> photosynthesis works. Now, photosynthesis happens everywhere. It's also very inefficient. If we understood photosynthesis in de detail, we might be able to re-engineer it for our own benefit. So it's this new frontier of atomic resolution and time that was opened in 2009 when we turned on the world's first hard x-ray free electron laser with its, I'm going to call them ultra bright, because we pack a lot of x-rays into a very, very short pulse, and they're ultra fast. So just going into a little more detail of the science, the kinds of science that's done, if we had this ultra-fast, ultra-bright x-ray source, mm -hmm. we could make movies of chemistry in action, like photosynthesis. One of the processes, it's used, everything in your life involves catalysis, and ca steps of catalysis, I mean, from making fuels to all sorts of things. We could actually watch catalysis happen. Right now, when we design better catalysts, we're kind of blind, and we're trying to figure out what might make a better catalyst, and how to make it more efficient. Again, we know the reactants we put together, and we know the end products, but there's all these intermediate states that are happening on the femtosecond time scale, and this ultra-bright, ultra-fast source would let us study them. We can do three-dimensional, dynamical studies in biology. This pretty picture here is just a three-dimensional diffraction pattern. It's actually data from the Linac coherent light source um, of uh, some uh, biological uh, nanocrystals. We might understand cell function better. Uh, we certainly can look at uh, structure and time resolve function of either single molecules or nanocrystals. By the way, the technology development of these experiments is in process now. I'm not going to be able to show you that it 
all of this works because we have demonstrated all that it works, but I'll give you a sense of where we are on it. So this, the, this new frontier is open with free electron lasers, and, and I just want to keep emphasizing the focus is on dynamics. It's this femtosecond resolution in time that we're so excited about. Now, I always have to put this slide in because somebody always asks me, as I describe to you how the free electron laser works, it's going to become abundantly obvious this doesn't work the way a normal laser works. And in fact, a laser purist would say it's not a laser. A laser, if I can remind you of the definition, is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. That's not what's going to be going on here. The lazy medium is actually going to be a relativistic electron beam in the lasers you're familiar with, like this one. It's either a gas or a solid state medium, or in some cases a liquid. Um, the radiation product, it's intense, it is coherent, okay? which is, I think, the critical uh, thing that you have to be in order to be called a laser. And so it's laser-like and, you know, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, cracks like a duck, whatever it is, we're going to call it a laser. And it has complete tunability. Most lasers, like this one, is just red. I'm not going to be able to make it green. The free electron laser, I can get any x-ray wavelength I want out of it by tuning the input electron beam. So I'm going to give you a couple of slides of how this thing works. Then I'm going to show you a, uh, a little animated clip of how it works. And then I'm going to tell you how it actually worked. So the concept is you make a very, very short bunch of electrons. You start with electrons. So that's why slack's involved. Because we have that two mile long electron linux. Actually, we don't even use the whole thing. We're going to use a third of it. I don't need the whole two miles. I only need one kilometer. But we make the best electron bunches in the world. So you have to make a very, very short micron scale size bunch of electrons. And I'm going to pack a billion electrons into that little micron uh, size bunch. And what happens when I move that micron sized bunch through what are called undulator magnets. So think of the pinks are north poles and the greens are south poles. So this, this bunch is wiggling up and down. When you wiggle charged particles, if you took any electrodynamics, they radiate. And so it makes radiation. The beams are so intense, the wiggles are so precise. What happens is that the spontaneously emitted x-rays that come from wiggling the bunch start to affect the bunch itself. And it starts to order the bunch until the ordered bunch is a set of little micro bunches, all of which are locked in step to each other, and they all start to radiate coherently. And that's why you get coherent radiation out. You will note it's actually a sort of spontaneous process that's getting this started, which means I don't have as much control as I would like at this point, and that's something we haven't upgraded that will fix. But it still works directly. So this is actually a simulation of how it works. This is a, a simulation of a bunch of a billion electrons going through the undulator magnet. You see them oscillating, and oh, wow, look at that. OK, it's just electricity mechanism, no quantum mechanics required. You microbunch the bunch, and now they start to radiate coherently. So that simulation was one of the fundamental mathematical calculations done when we were trying to figure out if this thing was going to work. Bless you. Now, as I said already, the electron beam is absolutely key to the success of this machine. Uh, without a beautifully prepared electron bunch, it's just not going to work. You have to have extremely high peak current. The, the electrons have to be, and of course the electrons don't really want to be close to each other because they're all the same charge, so they just like, like to get away from each other, but we don't allow them to do that. The electrons are kept in, in, a, in a very tight little bunch. Typically, we've got six billion electrons in a 30 micron sphere. Okay? That takes a lot of work to do that. And the performance depends exponentially on the electron beam. I can't resist showing a picture of Claudio Pellegrini. He is the father of the Linux coherent light source, a professor now emeritus at UCLA. He was the one in the 90s who said, hey guys, we can make an x-ray laser from the Slack Linux. And he pushed it. And that's how far the idea goes back. It's the early 1990s. And here in, in 2011, I just want to say this free electron laser concept is not new. Okay? 
Um, this guy, John Nady, in 1977, operated the first free electron laser. That's where you use this relativistic electron as the medium for the laser. And today, there's something, and these numbers actually are, are, are they're correct to 10% because it's a very dynamic situation. Uh, and a new uh, free electron laser just turned on a couple months ago, and it's not accounted for there. But there's about 22 operating and 19 proposed in construction. This is a dynamic moving field. However, they're all in the infrared, they're in the visible, they're in the extreme ultraviolet, but before the LCLS, nothing was in the hard x-rays. Now, everything gets harder as you go to harder x-rays because you're going to shorter wavelengths and so all the tolerances scale. So if it's really hard to get 6.5 nanometer radiation, it's 50 times harder to get 0.15 nanometer radiation. And on top of that, that every one of these machines has a reputation for being cranky, difficult to operate, unreliable. I just had some of my scientists who sent me a note. I asked if they were going to be in town. They were going to go do an experiment on flash. And uh, they said, oh, the electron gun's not working, our experiment got canceled, we're, we're available for what I was wanting them to do. <laughs> so, very well deserved reputation for these machines. They are non-trivial uh, non to operate. So now I'm going to show you the little simulation of how the thing works in action. And I just want to remind you, from the outside, okay, for the question about the San Andreas Fault, it's back here. Okay? This is foreshortened, but this is the two mile in at, and at the one, this is one kilometer of the three kilometers. So it's, it's, there's an injector, there's a kilometer of electron acceleration, there's going to be just some drift, and then the undulator hall, where the electron beam gets wiggled back and forth and the x-rays are made, is going to happen under here, and then the experimental halls are there. Okay, so this is how it works. This is the surface buildings. It's the Kleistron Gallery that you see when you're driving down Highway 280. 40 feet down, there is a photocathode. What that is is laser pulses from a, a laser you buy at the store, sort of, uh, come down and hit that photocathode, and a bunch of electrons is ejected. And we then take that bunch of electrons, and we very carefully shape it. They're pretty low energy at this point. And we just inject them at that point into the final kilometer of the original slack stuff that was built in 1962. Pretty much it's unchanged. At this point, what we're doing is we're just taking those electrons and bringing them up to energy. The energy of the electrons is going to determine the energy of the x-rays. There are two dog legs. We just saw one of them. There'll be another one up here, which is a clever electromagnetic trick to shorten the electron bunch. Because the length and time of the electron bunch is going to determine the length and time of the x-ray pulse. And after my two little uh, uh, tricks at shortening the electron bunch, I get it up to whatever energy I want, which if you're interested in the amount is between 5 and 15 GeV. And now I go into some drift space. So we just let the electron bunch drift along here. There's some diagnostics so we know what it's doing. And then we go into the undulator hall, and that's where I like to say the magic happens. The undulator hall is 100 meters of precision undulator magnet that are aligned over 100 meters to a fraction of the width of a human hair. You can't actually align it by normal alignment techniques. We use the electrons themselves to align it. You can see the electron bunch wiggling up and down here and as it goes through the undulator magnets and starting to, it is very schematic at this point, but starting to, to radiate uh, X-rays, which now start to order the bunch and make the bunch uh, start to radiate coherently. Pretty soon you'll see it all ordered. There it's all ordered. And now, so now you have right on top of each other this bunch of electrons and a bunch of coherent X-rays, this coherent X-ray pulse. The, by the way, it's up, these pulses are coming at 120 pulses per second. You get to the end of the undulators, and now I've done with the electrons. So I have to get rid of them. I have a big magnet, and it bends the electrons down into the ground, into the dump, and the x-rays stream free into the experimental regions. And there are six experimental regions in two experimental halls. There's the near hall and the far hall, uh, each with three experiments. Each experiment optimized 
to do somewhat different science. So there you see the near hall, there you see the top hall. Okay, and at this point, uh, four of those experiments are operating for users, one of them is in commissioning, and one of them is still in construction. This is what the undulator hall, which is where the magic happens, looks like in reality. It's 33 meter long undulator magnets, all lined up. And so what happened is we had to build on this. It was a $400 million project over several years, several congresses, continuing resolutions, you name it. Uh, but we finally got to where the undulators uh, had been built. There is a beam tube that goes through the undulators, which is about an opening the size of a soda straw. So the first thing we did was get, we got the electron bunch to be aligned to go down the soda straw. And there was a bedding board. How many pulses would it going to take us to get the electron bunch down the soda straw? And you know, I put 15, thinking I was really optimistic. I should have known, the guy who was in charge of commissioning put two. He got it down in two tries. Okay? Second bunch went down the soda straw. So that was great. And then we started putting the undulator magnets on, because if you don't have the undulators there, you're not going to get x-rays. So they put uh, all the undulators got installed in the tunnel in uh, late March of 2009. And then we, we, we talked to we talked to DOE and our sponsors and stakeholders, we're going to start the lasing campaign. Because we thought this was going to be a real challenge to get to work. And we started the lasing campaign, so we're really trying to manage expectations. We started the lasing campaign at 7 o'clock on April 10th by essentially putting one undulator on the beam line, and then the second one, and then the third one, and we sort of figured by the time we got most of them on there, the thing would, we'd start to see some radiation at least, and then we could tune it up. 10 o'clock, I was at home asleep, because lab directors go to bed early on Friday nights, and the phone call came, and they said, oh, we have a laser. It just worked. I have never in my entire life had an experiment work like that. Okay. Um, they stuck around for a couple of hours to measure it because they were just so excited. And then they closed the shutter on the electron beam and they all went home for the night and they came in at 9 o'clock the next morning and they opened the shutter and it was still lazy. And it hasn't stopped. It's just worked. All this business about being finicky and temperamental, not this machine. We actually started the first experiments in October. We, we hadn't well, again, managing expectations, we hadn't wanted to commit to the experimentalists that the beam would actually be ready for them to do experiments because, because we didn't really think it was going to work that well. And so we had what we defined as user-assisted commissioning. But people were on there writing, doing, uh, doing experiments, and writing papers on that data uh, six months after the first laser. It was just amazing. So this is a series of pictures in the control room. This is uh, Paul Emma, who did, led the commissioning team. And they're just starting the lazing campaign. And they're looking kind of worried. And then you see the spot starting to appear on the screen. And <laughs> this is the project manager. He's the guy who was in charge of spending the $400 million and making this happen. Uh, this is a, a plot we made uh, very shortly after turn on. And, uh, it's a little technical, but it shows some really interesting features. This thing didn't just work. It worked much better than anybody anticipated. And I have to set the scale. There was a large fraction of the community, including National Academy members and so forth, who never thought you could make this thing even laser. They thought we'd have a really bright x-ray source, but it wouldn't be a laser. And so against that, this is all the more stunning. I think the feature I'd like to emphasize here is that we never told you we had 100 meters of undulator. Okay. With a laser, you typically make a saturation curve. So you plot the power out depending on how, here, it's how much of the undulator it's gone through. And you expect it to come up, come up, come up exponentially because it's a laser uh, process. And then at a certain point, saturate and turn over. So we thought it was going to saturate and turn over around a meters. It's saturating around 60 meters. 
We had 50% more undulators than we even needed to make it work because the parameters of the electron bunch were that much better than we realized. Um, another thing was that we had planned, we sort of, we thought that we were going to have pulses around 100, 150 femtoseconds, which is kind of cheating because I sold this to you saying 10 femtoseconds is the interesting time scale. But in fact, Paul Emma figured out a way to get the sub 10 femtosecond pulses. And so within a matter of weeks after turning on, we were actually making the ultra short 10 femtosecond sub 10 femtosecond pulses. So this is what the thing was designed to do. It was designed to laze. I've got it in energy units. You can convert that into wavelength units. But it's essentially, um, it's about 1 in 15 angstroms and 1 and a half angstroms. We're actually able, able to go lower in X-ray energy and higher in X-ray energy. We thought we'd have fixed pulse width. And we've got this factor of 100 in the pulse width of the X-rays. And this was, this was one that's just floored us. We thought we would have up to 2 millijoules of energy. That's the amount of energy stored in a pulse. And we're three times that. So if you like peak power, it's 100 gigawatts. And we want a terawatt. And that's what we're heading towards. Um, so that's, it's a billion times brighter than any of those power, than the most powerful existing X-ray source. Just a huge, a huge success. Now, remember I told you this was going to be like Dickens? 2009 was a watershed year for the lab. And let me try to set the context. So Slack in 2008. So the high energy frontier has moved away from Slack towards Europe. And in fact, we in 2008 turned off the last high energy accelerator on the site. Now remember, this is a lab that for 45 years has identified itself with high energy physics done with an accelerator and all of a sudden the last accelerator has been turned off. And whereas we knew it was going to turn off in September of 2008 because of a budget crisis, we actually had to turn it off in April. So it wasn't even allowed to go out gracefully. It was pretty brutal. Coincident with that early turn off of the, the B factory, the machine that studied the B quarks, and the budget crisis, we had a major layoff. So I had been acting director starting in 2007, but I was made director in December 2008. And my first all hands to the staff was announcing the largest layoff in the laboratory history. 15% is a lot, and particularly in a, in a national laboratory or some more academic institution. In industry, it's actually something that's not a big deal, I guess. But this was something that Slack and the national laboratory community in general was not. I talked about this really wonderful future in particle astrophysics, which is a wonderful future, except most of the laboratory wasn't on board with it. They, Slack had been so successful in the 70s and 80s, the mentality of the laboratory was, let's just figure out how to make the world go back to the 70s, and we'll be great again. Now, you're all at different kinds of institutions, whether they're academic or industrial or whatever government, you know there's been a huge change in the world since the 70s to the modern day. And every kind of institution has evolved, whether it's academic or national lab, <laughs> or industry, or business. Slack had not evolved. It just hadn't evolved because it was so successful in the 70s that it kept saying, I don't need to change because I, I figured out the key to success. Of course, the key to success is a very fleeting thing. In 2008, the project, which I've just told you how successful the turn on was, it was struggling. DOE demands that our projects be delivered on time and on budget, and it didn't look like we were going to be able to do either of those. Okay? And I had to bring in some external management help, again, a not, uh, a not popular move. And the project manager I showed you there, he could have walked and the whole thing could have tanked, but he was I had to make the bet that he was going to be loyal enough that he was going to stay when I brought in a new person to help get the project uh, on track, and we did. Um, we still had these tremendous technical risks. We had all these people out there in the community saying, oh, you've got to be kidding. That's never going to laze. And, and then we had to change the lab name, which sounds really stupid, but it was this emotional focal point for the lab. 
and it really, really hurt people. Fast forward to 2010. The particle astrophysics future is opening up. The Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope has launched. It's deployed on orbit with a speed and uh, just success that was un almost unprecedented. It just worked. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, our next big project, had gotten the green light from the Decadal Survey to go forward. So we actually had a path, we had a runway for particle astrophysics. The LCLS technical risks have been retired. The performance, I use the phrase, you know, in a world where it you know, fails to meet expectation, meets expectation, and, and exceeds expectation, LCLS had annihilated expectation. <laughs> and it was both, by 2010, both the laser performance, which be good on one day, but this was good over months and now years, the early science was starting to come out. And the papers in Nature were attracting all sorts of attention. And finally, I like to say the laboratory was prepared to focus on its future and not its past. But it was rough. This was not an easy period uh, for any of us. But of course, it's the results that count. So let me tell you a bit about the science. So, we're a user facility. We run the LCLS for the world. Scientists send proposals in, we evaluate those proposals, and people get beam time based on how their proposals are ranked. We are totally saturated with proposals. Five times more people want beam time than we can assign beam time. And in fact, it's that people won't submit. You know, after they've been turned down two or three times, they kind of give up, and that's the, the way that's that's the position we're in. We're having to try and fix it. Um, we do a broad variety of science, from physics to biology to chemistry to material science. And so evaluating those proposals across those fields is a real challenge. The early science targets have been the first early ones were atomic and nanoscale structure and biosystems. Turned out that was one of the easy problems to attack. And then electronic structure and materials related to catalysis and chemical bonding. One of the key things that I want to point out, because it will be important in some of the examples I show, you know, when this laser pulse hits a little sample, you can guess what happens. The sample gets blown up, right? That's the end of the sample. So the key is, do the x-rays scatter and you can detect them fast enough that you can get a clean signal before you get the garbage from the explosion? And that was one of the things that had to be determined. And that is one of the things that the short pulse length has been absolutely critical for. It's turned out 70 femtoseconds is about the magic number. And if the pulse length is 70 femtoseconds or shorter, probe before destroy. So we have euphemistic we like to call it. Works. Uh, if we go up to 300 femtoseconds, we see that we're damaging the sample before we actually can, can look at the structure. But yeah, it's determining things like that that's taken some of the time of the early so now let me just give you again a conceptual, how would I study a, a biomolecule or a nanocrystal with this thing or a cell? Imagine you drop these little biomolecules or whatever it is you want to image into the x-ray beam. So those white pulses where the x-ray pulses, I'm going to start this again. Um, and they intersect and the x-rays scatter. And I capture the scattering pattern on a pulse by pulse basis. And then I have to put together the <coughs> noisy images from a bunch of subsequent shots. And then I have to somehow figure out how to reconstruct the shape of the original object from the scattered objects. Again, let me give you an analogy, not a perfect analogy, but to give you a sense of how challenging this is. Imagine that you have a very, you have a nice calm swimming pool and a very misshapen rock. Okay? What happens if you drop the rock into the swimming pool? You make ripples. Those ripples hit the edge of the pool. Imagine recording the ripple pattern on the edge of the pool and using that to reconstruct the shape of the rock. That's what we're doing. Okay? You get to drop the rock a lot, which helps, but it's challenging. So one of the uh, early experiments was um, to do single shot imaging of a virus particle. Now, why do you want to do x-ray imaging of the virus? Well, a virus, this particular virus, is big. It's about uh, half a micron in diameter. That's big enough that standard techniques like electron microscopy 
are limited because electrons don't have that beautiful penetrating power that x-rays do. So you'd like to use x-rays to actually penetrate the thing and get a picture of the entire virus. It's a 2D projection, but hey, if I can get the 2D projection, I'll figure out a way of doing it stereoscopically and get 3D. Other techniques have involved uh, slicing it. Well, that kind of messes it up when you slice it. Uh, make thin slices, cryo -VM. Anyway, it's, it's a target for if you can make x-ray images, you will learn a lot that we don't know about what cells look like inside. So they took the Mimi virus. You can't crystallize this because it's got these little fibrils around the uh, uh, outside. And they put a, a jet. It wasn't dropping single particles. That's too hard. But you have a jet, uh, a liquid jet that streams across the x-ray beam. You intersect them. You have the density of the, of the virus particles high enough that you have a pretty good chance of, of hitting, but not double hits. So typically, we can get 20 to 30 percent hit rate on 120 hertz. The original experiment was done in December 2009. That's very, very early. And it was literally, they had been doing a whole set of these imaging experiments and they'd run out of samples. And so somebody said, oh, I've got some mini virus. Let's just put them in there and take a couple hundred shots. That's made one of the more uh, uh, cited nature papers. And now they've repeated the experiment with several million shots. And we don't have the data results from that yet, but I'm looking forward. This is the author list from the nature paper. Okay, laugh. <laughs> What's the echoes of high energy physics again, right? These guys have had to learn to work in very large teams to make these experiments work. Different, very different uh, culture for them. The data acquisition, the data handling, our high energy physics experience and background was very helpful here. We never ever say that they are copying high energy physics. We just say the high energy physics was there to help them, but they're defining new ways of doing experiments. Um, the, this is, sorry, I went too fast. This is what the data looks like. So there's the, uh, uh, the, the uh, source delivering the virus particles, the particle beam, the diffraction patterns. This is what a, a single shot looks like. It's actually, I was down there um, <coughs> when they put the Mimi virus in, and they were having trouble getting the beam to intersect, and I had a meeting, so I, I left. And as I'm walking up the stairs, somebody shouts, oh, wait, 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 we got it. And I walk back in. And there on the screen, shot after shot after shot, you just see these diffraction patterns coming up. And each one is an x-ray pulse intersecting a virus particle. And then you have to take those shots and you have to reconstruct the virus particle. Now, I am not going to even try to convince you that we've learned anything about the structure of the Mimi virus. Now, I'm a little irritated here because I have, oh, there it is. Okay, hmm? I do have this. This is now a three-dimensional reconstruction. These were the initial two-dimensional reconstructions, and they've been put together into a three-dimensional reconstruction. We are seeing in homogeneous interior structure. Big surprise. Um, can we turn this into critical data about how a cell works? I don't know that yet. But we are going after this very hard because we think if we can make this work, we think it's game changing. Uh, and the biologists are very, very excited. Another experiment that, um, one of the early experiments that has very pretty results is uh, a um, catalysis experiment where, remember, we, we, we put a bunch of things together, we get some stuff out, that's how catalysis works. Uh, pardon the chemists in the audience, this probably didn't satisfy you, but. Um, can we look at these intermediate states? And we've taken a toy system with uh, carbon monoxide on ruthenium, and we've been able to actually see the intermediate state, which no one's been able to see before. We've been able to, to tell that it has a weakened bond to the surface, and that its desorption occurs from that state because of that weakened bond to the surface. Toy system at this point. Next step, we'll be taking this to real system. Now, what do we do next? Okay, we've got LCLS, we're finishing off the experimental touches, we've got tons of users. The capability of this machine so exceeded expectation that we had not even finished the project when we were invited to submit a proposal for the upgrade. So right now, we are in the process, and we hope to do construction start um, in another year, 
of another $400 million upgrade to LCLS because the science is just so compelling. And we just have capability we never dreamed of. Now, actually, whereas we dream of capability, the real reason we've got to go to the upgrade is we've got to increase the capacity. <coughs> you open a new frontier, it's terrible if only a very small segment of the population has access to it. And the demand is there. However, there are a bunch of things like we'd like to be able to go down below the um, uh, 280 electron volts, which is the carbon K edge, and it lets us really study carbon-based um, molecular compounds. We'd like to go to harder X-rays, which are more penetrating, allow us to study thicker samples, which are important for some applications. We'd love to go below a femtosecond. Um, actually, we can't even measure the time width of the five femtosecond pulses. We're just estimating them. But we'd love to go down below a femtosecond. We'd like to be able to separate the effects of charge and spin, and that um, would be variable polarization. We like to do what's called seeding, so that instead of amplifying spontaneous emission, we actually are, are amplifying a well-defined pulse. That's actually something that's in process and we'll be delivering that in the next six months. And so LCLS2 is on the road. Remember I told you, we only use one-third of the LINAC for LCLS1. Well, I've got two-thirds of the LINAC left, so we'll use another third of the LINAC for LCLS2. We'll have um, we'll bypass LCLS1, we'll have new undulator halls and new experimental halls. And we anticipate being online with LCLS2 by 2018. So here's the new slide. <coughs> um, this is where the threads all come together. Uh, we intend to be the premier photon science laboratory in the world. That's photon science is the science done with these specialized x-ray beams. There's two components to that. I've emphasized having the world leading facilities, and we have that with LCLS1 and LCLS2. However, it's not enough to just have the facilities and all the users in the world coming to your lab. We have to have some of the scientists that are driving those facilities to their future. And so we have to grow what I call our performing science, um, where it's the science that we Slack and Stanford scientists do at these facilities. What I, the way I like to express it to the president and provost of Stanford when I'm trying to get money out of them is, Nobel Prizes will be won yes. on the LCLS. I want some of those Nobel Prizes won by Slack and Stanford scientists. Okay. We want to maintain our position as the premier accelerator of laboratory. That accelerator capability, developed through decades of work in high energy physics, is what allowed us to turn the LCLS on the way we did. There's just no question, and that is what will take us to our next reinvention in the decades to come. It is what makes our laboratory special. It is our core capability. Um, many other people are now looking at building X-ray free electron lasers. There's one being built in Germany. There's one uh, that's recently turned on in Japan. We want to be the laboratory with a free electron laser, X-ray free electron laser R&D capability for the world. And then. We're not getting out of the field of particle physics. We want strategic programs. In, we are participating in the LHC and CERN. Our, our school programs, strategic ones are particle astrophysics and cosmology. The synergy between those programs is so important to us. LCLS could not have handled their data, I don't think, without some help from the online data experts from high energy physics. That having two capabilities at the laboratory has been enormously beneficial for everybody. So, the future, um, it's exciting. We've reinvented ourselves. It's a great strength of the national lab system. I gotta tell you, this is not the first time a laboratory has reinvented itself, and it's not the last time a laboratory has reinvented itself. I think we, ours was a little messier than most because we did it so quickly, but it's, it really is a strength of the system. We've opened these new scientific frontiers, and it's a time of just great, great opportunity. And all of us think, I could stand up here and talk about the targets we have today and the science we're doing today, but I think the biggest surprises are yet to come. Thank you very much. We will now take some questions. And since it's a little hard to hear in this room, when you're asking your question, if you would please stand and try to speak up. Yes, sir. Uh, it sounds like you're limited by your machining, perhaps, to get things down to this tolerance that you need. But 
how about going the next step to gamma rays? Would, would that lay, would they laze? And do they also penetrate? Or well, so, um, so you could definitely get um, uh, gamma rays to penetrate. That's not a problem. The problem is they penetrate so well that they don't scatter so well, so they don't actually tell you much about the materials. Essentially, materials become transparent. So um, now, there's a lot of space between x-rays and gamma rays, and people who want to do things like stockpile stewardship, where they're interested in looking at what's going on inside a warhead or something at Los Alamos, they're extremely interested in LCLS, not going to the gamma ray range, but they'd like to take it to the, what I would call ultra hard x-rays. And there, because there you're penetrating really large objects. The problem with going all the way to gamma rays is you won't scatter off anything, so you won't actually see a whole lot. But, but going harder x-rays, it's, it's within the technical capability. We're not limited by machining. And uh, it's within the technical, technical capability. And in fact, Los Alamos National Lab, I think the director's in my office on Monday, because he wants to talk about building an x-ray free electron laser, an ultra-hard x-ray free electron laser there for just that application. Yes, sir. Could you give a little, stand up, uh, Could you give a little estimate of the wavelength range of your X-ray laser? Yeah. So um, you want an angstroms or nanometers? Uh, I like nanometers. You like nanometers? Okay. Um, point one five nanometers to one point five. Did I do that right? It's fifteen angstroms to one point five angstroms, so it's one point five nanometers to point one five nanometers. Is that? Okay, it's 1.5 angstroms. It's 1.5 angstroms to, to 15, 15 angstroms. Right. Except we actually go down closer to 1 angstrom. 1 to 15 angstroms. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, three quick things. Uh, one, I didn't understand um, going from the electrons lining up to the x ray. In other words, that's sort of you draw them off, but I didn't understand okay. what happens there. Uh, two, is there a way to isolate dark matter? Because I assume it's kind of everywhere, so to speak. In this room? Yeah. To hit it with this kind of view. Okay. And What's the third question? <laughs> Do I to choose the order? The third would be easier. Well done. Uh, the third is, assuming you didn't want to use your son as a piggy bank, what happened to the portal? Uh, <laughs> just what you think would have happened. <laughs> yes. Okay. That one was easy. Um, the, <laughs> the first question, um, the x-rays are being generated by that electron bunch all the way along. The minute you take that electron bunch and you put it in the 100 meters of an undulator magnet, if you take an electric charge and you wiggle it, you accelerate it, you make x-rays. So you have x-rays and the electrons traveling together through that whole 100 meters. As you move along, the x-rays are influencing the electrons and doing this ordering. So then that the x-rays, then subsequent x-rays, get ordered with each other. And so then at the end, I've got the coherent x-rays and the electrons all moving together. So, I mean, is that helping? How is it, though, that it creates the x-ray? That's what that, sorry, that's electric. E&M 101, <laughs> take an electric charge and accelerate it, and you will get radiation. But Maxwell's equations. Okay. Now, the third one is, can't I take my free electron laser and shoot it at dark matter? The problem with dark matter, and why we're having such a hard time finding it, is it actually doesn't interact with much. Okay? So um, it doesn't interact with electromagnetic radiation. So if I took you and pressed you really tightly and made you into a neutron star or something, or a regular star, you'd, you'd shine. Right? The matter we're made of makes stars that shine. Dark matter doesn't make things that give off photons. and doesn't interact with photons. So it, or the interaction is extremely so it, there's nothing interesting there to do. Yes? I'm reminded of x-ray crystallography, which I had to do as a student. Mm -hmm. This is very closely related to that. And uh, aren't you taking a bunch of little snapshots, really, with each pulse? 
So let's say you have a photosynthesis target flying through. You're going to see it, and, and I'm curious how you separate the tumbling and everything of okay. the molecules from what might be the photosynthesis dynamics. So it's a very good question. First, what you have to remember is every time I make the x-ray beam intersect with the nanocrystal or whatever, I blow it up. So I don't get to take multiple pictures, <laughs> right? So then what I have to do is combine pictures, and you say, well, but there are different orientations. Okay. One of the miracles of this machine was the x-rays are so intense that each image has so much information in it that I can get some of that basic orientation information using standard packages that do image reconstruction crystallography. And so I, I actually the combination, I mean, what I have to do is I have to filter. So I might take, at the moment it's crude, 10,000 pictures. I'll filter for quality and narrow it down to 1,000 pictures. And then those I'll be able to do actually, they'll have enough information on each shot that I can put them together and, and basically just, I'll get enough information that I'll know if it's tumbled or rotated or whatever. Now, the next harder thing to do, and actually I was down, uh, I used to go down on the weekends to see what's running, and I was down about 10 days ago. The weekend, not last weekend, the weekend before. And they were doing an experiment where they were looking for dynamics. So they were shooting a laser at photosystem 2, which is one of the key proteins in photosynthesis. They were shooting the laser to start a process. But they were shooting a normal laser, off-the-shelf laser, start a process. And then at a fixed time later, hit with the x-ray laser. Shoot the laser, hit with the x-ray laser. Shoot the laser, hit with the x-ray laser. You've now got effectively that sequence of the galloping horse. Okay? But again, it relies on enough information in each shot to be able to take out the other things you're talking about. And again, let me go back to the miracle of this machine. The fact that we're able to get five, six, four millijoules is what's giving us the headroom to get so many scattered x-rays that we can do that kind of reconstruction. We didn't know we had that until we turned this thing on. The way I describe it is, at the time when we turned this thing on, I needed a miracle, and I got it. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that as a scientist, but I'm sorry. <laughs> Here it is. Yes, ma'am. Uh, have you been able to, uh, has anyone been able to do experiments which are looking at the gating processes across cellular membranes involving maybe some of the heavier metals, this was an area in which I worked for almost 20 years. Like, I, I mean, I once designed or proposed an experiment to study iron being transported across uh, pathogenic membranes. And, and I'm wondering, and that's a slow process, right. but I'm wondering, because you can take these quick snapshots, are you able to see any of the transport processes? So first, we're nowhere near that yet. There is work in that field, but we're nowhere near that oh, yet. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> but we'll get there. We'll get there. There's a question back. Yes, sir. Um, I was just wondering, I know it's kind of impossible to answer this yet, but what would be some of the most important implications of going to the femtosecond scale? Uh, well, so most of these chemical processes, we're right at the edge, we're right at five femtoseconds, and so it's just giving you headroom on the resolution on, on these processes. So um, the, the chemical time frames are at hundreds of attoseconds to femtoseconds. So uh, it's just, it's time resolution on chemistry. I mean, that's, it's so nothing completely different. I don't think it's anything completely different, but I, I so first, I have to remember the inter my PhD's in atomic physics, and then I've done particle physics and astrophysics. So I'm learning real time. So sometimes with questions like that, uh, there could be something out there, and I just don't know. Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Is this lab earthquake proof? <laughs> uh, we are very earthquake proof. We meet all of the California standards and codes. We put a lot of money and effort into making sure they're earthquake proof. And um, we've been through many earthquakes, including Loma Prieta, uh, which was the big one in the Santa Cruz Mountains that did a lot of damage. That was when the section of the Bay Bridge came down. It was during the World Series or something like that. I was in. Cornell at the time. 
Uh, and uh, we realign the LEDAC and we go on. Uh, all of the mounts for the undulators are built to withstand X, G's, you know, where X is some number that code states. And so, yes, we are earthquake proof. Now, it's a good question though. Back in the early 60s, late 50s, when Panofsky was coming to DC to advocate for building this laboratory in California, there was a, a strong East Coast contingent. This is history that I wasn't. I, mean, I was alive then, but I don't. This is not firsthand. This is how the tale has been told to me. There was a strong East Coast contingent that didn't think that anybody should be spending 100 million dollars on accelerators in California to begin with. And second, and they would the earthquake argument came up a lot, and so a lot of study was done in the early days of SLAC to prove that it would be earthquake safe. Now we are aligned perpendicular to the San Andreas Fault for a reason. That's the most uh, stable uh, orientation, it turns out, and we're sitting in bedrock. So it's actually the safest place to be in an earthquake at Slack is in the tunnel. <laughs> 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 the machine off. <laughs> <laughs> it actually would go off real fast. <laughs> yes, sir. So are they going to reuse the, the, the ring, the circular ring at the end? Uh, the yes. End? So actually, it's already been reused once. It was first, there was a machine called PEP that was trying to be an energy frontier machine uh, in competition with a machine in Germany in the uh, 80s. And what PEP was supposed to do was discover the top core. And it had a center of mass energy of about 35 GeV. The theorists were all saying, you know, the top core is just around the corner. Unfortunately, the mass of the top core was about five times heavier than that. They didn't come close. They did some very nice uh, other science. And then it got turned off. And then it got rebuilt as the B factory studied B quarks. So it's been recycled once. And my x-ray scientists would love to turn that into what they call an ultimate storage ring, a, an ultimate ring-like machine where you don't get the time resolution that you do from LCLS, but you can get exquisite energy and positional resolution for just different kinds of studies. I mean, ultimately, you want energy, space, and time at the atomic scale. And so that's what they have. They want uh, energy and space at the atomic scale with that machine. So there are discussions of how we might reuse it, but the priority is the rebuild of the, the upgrades to the LCLS. Yes? Well, is there a limit uh, to the speed of the femtosecond? Uh, and if not, I mean, is it theoretically uh, possible <coughs> to image even the plane of space time? No, but the, um, the femtosecond is set by the length of the electron bunch. Now, is there a fundamental limit for how short we can make the electron bunch? Yes, 100 attoseconds. So that's a tenth of a femtosecond. That is the shortest, theoretically, we could ever make a pulse of x-rays out of the LCLS. And, I mean, I've made it sound like a, a real fast process because it's a, it's a process that is what we're studying, and it's the interesting time scale for atoms. But, but the particle physics side of the lab has, you know, studied faster processes, and it's it's not it's not unheard of, I guess, is what I'm saying. It's unheard of for X-rays. Lasers have already gotten into the attosecond regime, visible lasers, but they don't penetrate, so they can't do the science. Yes, sir. Once you've made the, the photon beam. When you separate the electron beam, mm -hmm. do you have an, any option or techniques where you might be able to preserve the microstructure of the electron pulse and separate one layer or subplace? Well, what the closest thing, I'm just trying to think, why I would want to do that. Very short pulse. Short pulse of electrons. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, it's pretty hard to separate the electron subpulses. Once you bend it. You know, well, once you bend it, it's gone. It's just gone. Yeah, yeah. No, then it's gone. Once it's bent, it's gone. I, I'm just trying to think there would be any way of. You see, if we could do that, so I'm not an accelerator physicist, and there is an accelerator physicist in the back of the room, so he's going to tell me if I'm about to say something really stupid. But if we could do that, 
then I would have very short, I'd have at a second electron pulses, which I would simply, I would have done that way back at the beginning, and then I would use that as seeding. And I don't believe that's how people are talking about seeding, but most of the seeding has to do with making a little x-ray pulse, or filtering the x-ray pulse, and then using that as the seed. So I actually don't, did I say that right? I mean, do you know of any way? Do you understand the question? I think you pretty much said it. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm right. I'll ask. Good question. Is there a final question? One more question. Yes. Were the magnets made, and did you have any problems sourcing things in the United States to build the device? So the undulator air magnets, so National Labs partnered together, and the undulator magnets were actually contracted out to Argonne National Lab in Illinois. And they designed them, and they had a company build them, and there was no problem with that process at all. It, it worked expensive, but um, we, we did that. Now, there have been parts of uh, some of the specialized detectors and x-ray mirrors that we've used have been made outside of the United States. But um, in terms of technical capability for the building of this machine, uh, the bulk of the money was spent in the U.S. Um, with U.S. manufacturers, and that was not an issue. Thank you, Josh Drell. <laughs> in appreciation for your uh, delivering the lecture here at the Philosophical Society, We'd like to present you with a framed copy of the signed announcement. It's been signed by all the members of the General Committee. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.